Welcome, everybody. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you made it to the Devology Livecast, where we do all kinds of stuff. But today, we're specifically, we're going to dive into sandbox games, and we're going to analyze and uh, check out some details and give game design critique and insight into some of the awesome stuff that we are witnessing in front of us. So I'm messing with audio settings right now on a game that I want to show off. Rick had his own game he wanted to show off, um, but I'm not sure he's going to make it. So we will get started. Uh, before we do, though, how's everybody doing? Y'all doing good? Y'all ready for this? We got any new people? I saw we had one or two people that haven't been here before. Welcome. Uh, the way this works is we just... Generally, we chat about game dev. We have different topics. We have different different uh, design philosophies and stuff like that. But today, specifically, we're doing what's called a game design deep dive, where we play through a game and we talk about some of the design components to it. It definitely works better with two people, but you know, we got to do what we got to do uh, this time around. So, the normal not to be used to your own voice. I know. Yeah, it's weird. Want to see Rick just starting his Unity course? He'll I he'll be here. He'll be here. Let's let's hope. Anyone heard of Minecraft? What's that? Is that like a sandbox? No. Okay. So Minecraft is the ultimate example of a sandbox game. So let's start by defining what a sandbox game is, and then we can dive into one of the games that I want to show uh, you to kind of talk about the specifics of, of how it works and all that stuff. So the way I define a, a sandbox game is kind of a game where you set your own objectives, right? Where a lot of games will tell you, go here, do this. A lot of games will say, you know, collect five wood or whatever. And there, there are sandbox games that have objectives built into them, but generally sandbox games are like a sandbox where you could just kind of can do whatever you want in them, right? Um, they tend to gear towards genres that are more simulation and more city buildery. Um, they tend to be more you know, have to do with building and stuff like that, but they don't have to. There's a lot of, there's sandbox shooters, there's sandbox, uh, all types of games. So what we're going to show today is one of my, uh, favorite kind of sandboxy games. And, uh, it's, it's been a while since I played it. So we're going to play it poorly, but we're going to kind of show it off. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm a fan of sandbox games. I like games where you set your own objective. And I think objectives are important for game design in general, right? If you don't know what to do or any of that stuff, it, it can be kind of, it doesn't feel as good when you play, right? Sometimes it feels like you're playing a tech demo or something like that. If, uh, if you don't, um, you know, sync up with the objectives. So anyway, the game I want to show is Miyun Base. Mayune base. It's like moon base, but you know, with moon, like, cause it's like a cat and it's pretty cool. Um, this, I'm really a fan of, uh, simpler games. I like games that have a really good UI and UX. I like games that are easy to get into. I don't like to spend a ton of time learning my game. And I think this game does a really good job at that. So if you've ever played uh, kind of survival, survival city builder type of games, this is similar to that, uh, but it's got a lot of sandbox elements and that's kind of what I want to talk about today. So start a new game. Uh, uh, it's been a while. We probably should start with the tutorial just so we can dive in. What should my space cat name be? What do you guys think? Um, Raggy. Thank you, Drake. Let's customize our character. So first of all, this is one of the really cool aspects. Not all sandbox games have character customization, but I think this adds to the element. Like a lot of RPGs have this kind of stuff, right? But it's really, really important uh, because I think if you're going to create a game where a player can do anything they want, it helps to kind of frame that uh, state of mind with the ability to customize who you are, right? Like you've got all these different choices. I like blue. I'm going to go with blue. You think the name should be Fluffle? Mr. Muse. Mr. Mr. You know what? Mr. Rick Fluffle Muse. Oh, it's not long enough. We can only have Mr. Rick Fluffle. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. 
Uh, kitty face. I like the black and, or the white and brown one. Let's go with that. But anyway, so custom uh, character customization is super important in games like RPGs because it, it kind of helps you get into the character. I think it's also one of those things that helps with sandbox games because it helps train the player that, hey, you're going to be making decisions. You're going to choose a lot of stuff and how it works, right? So, um, yeah, that's important. Building isn't required for sandbox. No, no, no. So sandbox, like I said, sandbox is a very open, loose term, right? I think something like a first person shooter is a lot more specific on what it is because it's it's a first person perspective and it's a game where you shoot stuff. But even FPS, for example, we've started to use for just first person games in general. We'll call it an FPS, even though it doesn't have guns, but it's a first person perspective. So sandbox specifically is kind of a looser open term. This game, for example, you could also call open world game. You could call it a city building game. You could call it a lot of different stuff. Um, but sandbox is generally a game where you kind of set your own objectives. You could also call it survival, you know, like there's a lot of, a lot of genres are, they mix with each other and stuff like that. So, okay. So we've got our little kitty cat so we can walk, move around with WASD. Um, while outside, keep an eye on your oxygen and suit power. That's up here. Oxygen and suit power. Uh, you also need to eat. The bars at the top part of the screen will show you your health and hunger. One of the things I like about this that I just want to point out, and this isn't a sandbox specific thing, but I want to point out the good UI here is every time they reference an item, obviously it would make the most sense to point to the item, but that's not always doable or easy to do in development. But one of the things they've done is they've highlighted the color of the object. So health is in red, hunger is in brown, and they put the color on the words there so that you can kind of associate the two quickly, right? Now, granted, they've got symbols that are pretty good. Food and, and, and heart symbol are pretty recognizable. But that, that little piece of UI really, really helps a ton. So I think it's a fantastic addition. Um, there's also some plants over there next to the base. Walk over and left click to pick them up. Same deal here, green plants, green plants. So we can left click, pick up our plants, our little kitty. And I may or may not have picked this game just because of how well Stray is doing in the Steam charts. You know, kitties are popular right now, they're hot. Um, Another aspect of sandbox games is that they often can be played without a predetermined goal in mind, even if the game explicitly states a goal at you. Minecraft's ended. Exactly. Um, Minecraft is the ultimate example. It's just the fact that that game is so widely part of culture that it wouldn't make sense to really show it off because everybody's kind of seen it. Um, but totally, like there's, there's other aspects to it. Use these plants to craft some food at the workbench. So this is a very easy, small, light tutorial. And it's, it's putting me on rails at first, but then it's going to open it up to kind of the sandbox aspect, right? So on the workbench, tells me to click on the food and I can craft. So this definitely is a survival crafting game as well, but it's also a sandbox game. So we've got our food, left click on the food in your inventory bar to equip it and then right click on it to eat. So we're going to right click once to eat. Our little kitty eats a bowl of food. Cool. One of the most important tools you need to collect resources is the shovel. Use these items and craft one. All right, so let's go to our workbench. We need wood and we need scrap metal. We're going to craft. Now, what this game is setting up is the overall sandboxy elements, right? It's showing me how to use these individual systems so that when I finally, um, let me pause it because my oxygen is going down and I'm gonna die. Uh, when I finally kind of understand all the systems, then I can go out and create my own objectives, right? So just because a game is sandbox doesn't mean that it can't have a tutorial or it can't put some kind of tutorial on rails and stuff. It can't teach you stuff like that, right? Um, that stuff is really important. Learning the game is still part of game design. Tutorialization is still part of game design. So just because something is sandboxy doesn't mean that you have to give the player complete freedom at first, uh, but it's just important to kind of note, right? So. Um, nice work. Keep your base refills of your suit's oxygen power. Go into the airlock and click and close the door. Uh, our oxygen is going down, so we're going to uh, click. Oh, this is the airlock, not that. My bad. So run a little airlock, click to close the door. Bases have a limited supply of oxygen, but this one has an air cleaner that keeps producing more. So it's charging up our oxygen, which is pretty sweet. At night, you'll need to supply the biofuel generator plants or wood to keep things running. Now, this is a really important point to note, right? This is kind of the one of the cores of 
the uh, the sandboxy types of games and generally open world crafting type of games too. But but sandbox games, even though you set your own objective, it does not mean that there can't be inherent objectives built into the game. So this is a perfect example. I need to refill my oxygen bar, right? I have to keep it up high. My player can get oxygen by going into my base, but my base gets oxygen from this generator and the generator needs fuel, right? So through my head, when I'm thinking through this, and I apologize if I'm using weird words, but I'm still, you know, recovering. Um, even though I'm setting my own objectives, technically, right? Like I'm saying I need to fill up the generator. The game still set that up for me, right? The game still said, hey, you've got to fill up your oxygen tank. You fill it up with the generator in your base. The generator in base needs lots of plants to, uh, to run, right? So they've... Even though they haven't explicitly said in in the little objective in the top right, collect five grass, they've created a system where I need to keep that generator fed, if that made any sense. So I'm going to go in here. I'm going to open up the thing. I'm going to go out. Biofuel. Uh, you can pick up and move base modules. And, uh oh, it got dark. <laughs> I'm talking too much. Uh, here's our base power. Holding down right click on the bottom habitat model to pick it up. I can't see anything. Do, 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 do. We're missing power now, too. Uh, head is spinning already. Is 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 it my explanation of the game types? Is it the game? If, if you guys have any questions on kind of what we're talking about, feel free to ask them in the chat. Would you consider Factorio to be a sandbox game? So I haven't specifically played Factorio, but from what I've seen, I would consider it to have sandbox qualities because you can kind of build your own stuff uh, whenever. Uh, holding down right click on that bottom habitat model to pick it up, but I can't see anything. So we kind of got to wait till daytime, which is cool because we can chat. So um, this is a very simple, simplified version of a lot of uh, open world survival crafting games, uh, which have a lot of uh, sandboxy elements in them. Um, I like this because I think it's more compatible with my type of game, but there's a lot of stuff like a, a lot of the open world crafting games have sandbox elements and it's important to night be, note because it, I think it takes a certain type of player to want to identify with, um, the way that these games work, right? Like some people like to be told exactly where to go and what to pick up. Some people do not. Some people like to be creative and create stuff. Um, and so it just comes down to kind of the different player types and different stuff. I think, I think old Rick Davidson might be, might be able to join us in a second. We'll see. Rimworld is more an adult version of this genre. Yeah, I would say so. Okay. So we've got daylight back. Game progress is saved. Sweet. Now we can open up our door, check this out. So this game has a lot of little things like this, like these energy storms and stuff like that. Holding down right click on the bottom half time model to pick it up. All right, it turns into a little thingy. Now go outside, equip the model you just picked up, and right click on an empty area to place it. We can place it. It looks pretty cool to be honest. I would highly recommend it. I love this game. I absolutely love this game. It's been a while since I played it. There's been a lot of updates to it, which is pretty cool. Modules placed adjacent to another can share their power and oxygen supply. So this is the other part of this. But we talked about how sandbox games kind of, even though they don't implicitly give you uh, objectives, they create scenarios where those objectives kind of come out of the gameplay, right? And so one of the things it just told me is that these individual modules they share their power and oxygen supply with other adjacent modules, right? So suddenly this whole base building aspect, it becomes important in, in where I place modules and where I place generators because they only share with adjacent things. Like this battery right here is only going to power things that are adjacent to it. So even though I'm creating my own objectives, the game is kind of saying, hey, uh, here are some things you need to know and kind of make all this work. And so my objective might be to 
uh, buy another generator, but the game has implicitly kind of giving me stuff that's maybe unpowered, right, to to create that generator and do all that. So that's important to note too. I'll just place adjacent to another can share their power and oxygen supply. Sweet. Got a scrap metal for that. You can also drop items from your inventory on the ground. Try dropping the scrap by selecting it and press the Q key. Let's go boop, press the Q key. We drop the scrap. Finally, around the world, you'll find strange artifacts. You'll need to collect and process these in a research lab to unlock new tech upgrades. So yeah, so that's kind of just generally explaining the game. This button opens up the tech upgrade menu and lets you see all the artifacts you've discovered. Excellent, that's all for now. Also, your workbench can now make more items. Sweet. So now they've kind of opened it up for us. So we've got a tech menu. We've got a bunch of stuff we can make here. Research log. So, so this is the other part about sandbox games too. So again, at this point, I've, I've hammered home a few times, but I just want to illustrate it, is that the fact that they haven't given me any implicit objectives on what I'm supposed to do, but they've locked all of this stuff, right? So I can see all of this stuff here and I can click on it and it says, oh, it requires chemistry. Well, how do I get chemistry, right? And I kind of work backwards from there. So I understand from the, from the actual systems in the game, kind of what I need to make all this happen. So this requires construction, it costs five samples. Okay, well, how do I get a sample? Well, first thing I would do is I would go into my workbench and uh, see if I could find, oh, I need to get oxygen real quick. Let's see if I can find that somewhere in my uh, crafting menu. Rick is here. We need to celebrate. Hey, Tim, can you hear me? We can. Sorry Welcome about that. The squad. My computer, you know, it's sometimes technology. It's just, it's, it looks after you, then it doesn't look after you. So 20 minutes of my computer not booting and then plug, plug, beep, bop, boop, da, 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 rr, 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 all of a like, sudden. Okay, I boot now. I'm like, don't kind of know why or how, but here I am. There you go. Well, uh, I was just showing off this lovely little game called Mune Base, which stole my heart. Nice. Nice, nice, nice. So, Rick, w looking at this, what are your first impressions about it? Anything that stands out to you of what I'm doing? Mm. So, I, I guess you've had a fairly lengthy conversation about what is sandbox and what is not sandbox. Um, and at first glance, it, for me, it doesn't. All right, getting an old sandbox conversation. It doesn't feel sandboxy. It feels like world buildery, but that's because I saw these buildings over here. So I assume you're trying to build a base or something. So um, it, it has objectives. It's very sub subjective. The whole what is sandbox? Yeah. Um, just how many goals and rules and um, things to do can you have? It, the game yeah. we've got here looks really rad. Looks like you're trying to do a thing. It looks like you're trying to follow a story. Yeah, so the thing about this game that, that I like is that it sort of has all of these objectives, but they're not listed anywhere, right? They're not they're not objectives that it says, hey, go here and do this. They're not like map markers on my map that says this is where you do this thing or you got to assassinate this person or whatever, right? And so it kind of drops you in this world, but inherently the game has built a lot of these objectives into the systems themselves. So like I feel like I'm creating my own objectives, even though programmatically the game has said, oh, I need the, you know, I need the biogenerator fuel. So I got to go collect that. I need the scrap to be able to build my base. I need all these things. So inherently I have to go immediately and go collect all this stuff. And yes, it's definitely open world survival -y, uh, base building kind of deal. But I think it's also sandboxy in the fact that I have complete freedom to kind of do whatever I want within that space given that I collect the resources to keep myself alive, I have which a, I haven't done be, a good job of. To be contrarian, I have a game that uh, I was going to show off that I think for me typifies what is sandbox. Uh, so when you're done having a look at this, I can show the game and hope my computer doesn't like... Stick it to risk. All over the wall. Um, I think, yeah, fire it up. I think we're ready. I'm going to die anyway. I very poorly manage this character. He's now dying in the darkness, starving to death. So I feel really bad for this kitty. If I disappear, you'll know why. His name was well, Mr. Rick Fluffle. Exactly. Yes. Chat named it. I didn't. That was their fault. Yep. How's everyone doing today out there in, in the world? Having good times? 
Good. Zachary they can't says, me, Rick. They're not actually here. <laughs> they can't. You don't They're hear them. It takes My computer second. working or am I just dreaming all this? <laughs> uh, Zach says, Sandbox games give the f give me the feeling of player ownership over my own world or experience. I agree with that. And I think that's... So Rick may have a slightly different definition of what Sandbox games are than me, but I agree with Zachary in the fact that like I feel games that are sandboxy kind of give me control or the illusion of control in this case over my environment right like i know the game designer immune base set up the game specifically to where i have to go collect all that stuff but it still feels like i'm choosing to go do all that and i'm choosing on what to focus on and which generator to keep running and kind of which items to craft if that makes sense yep Okay, so I have a game right here I want to show off. Uh, oh, I have to share my screen. That'd be useful. Oh, whoa, computer. Computer, you behave yourself. Um, let me see if I can share the correct screen. Sandbox is a very broad term. Many games feature at least some sandbox elements. Yeah, I agree. Okay, I agree. Tim, if you wanted to... Oh, hmm. oh there we go. Whew. Oh yeah, I'm, there's going to be every time the computer thinks about something, I'm like, oh my goodness, the computer. Does anyone else at home have that where your computer just doesn't quite work and you spend all day, every day just like, when are you going to go on me? Don't go on me, Charlene. Whoop. Now my mic stand doesn't even work. What's going on? It must be like Friday the 13th or something. Yeah, ready? When I hear sandbox, I think open world survival. I think almost all the open world survivor games are also tagged sandbox. That's one of those like, you know, tags that just go together. So for me, sandbox is a lot to do with your design philosophy as well. So um, I don't know why my mic is misbehaving. It's a lot to do with your de design philosophy. So for me, if you can start with making a game where you just sort of make it and run around in the world and have fun, just just moving around in the world is fun. That for me starts to say you're a sandbox without requiring objectives and without requiring um you know story and all that kind of stuff so i'm going to show you what i think is the quintessential sandbox game and there have been some things laid on top of it such as achievements and uh bonus points for whoever guesses it first so uh tim i'm in game so could you switch on my screen for me please yes sir okay here we go let me what know game if you is this okay. oh, oh, da, da. so if anyone has seen this game, you play as a goat. It's called Goat Simulator. <laughs> it was pretty popular a few years ago. And the reason I think this is the quintessential sandbox game is there's joy in just moving around and like <laughs> banging into stuff. And you don't really, oh, there's another goat. Huh. Whoa, get out of there. And you get points a little bit like, you know, Tony Hawk style for doing stuff. And then you just, it's weird, right? It's weird and fun. And the whole, oh, now I'm doing a little skip. To, ah smash into the car it's fun just to move around and explore and that for me is what makes it a sandbox so you're like oh what's up here bonk into this fence off it goes flying into the swimming pool there's a trampoline why is there a trampoline don't know it doesn't make sense but we'll do a couple of bouncy bounces a little bit of a jump over there and so it's weird it's fun now i'm stuck in the in the pool <laughs> The thing I really love about this game, this is not the sandboxy nature of it, but it's broken, Tim. Look at that. Look at the rag doll on, the, neck. on his neck. And I'll see if I can lick the trampoline. Can I lick the trampoline? Oh, no, I just fell over. What is that yeah. button? What is that do? That was, that was the fall over button. Right, let me see if I can get out of here. There's oh. a fall over button? I think so. That button there, it's a fall this over. Game, yeah. So stuff like that makes this game charming. I mean, beyond just sandbox stuff. like. Yeah, man. Oh, what kind of game light. has a fall over yeah. button? Whoop. Oh, no. Okay, I'm trying to get out of the pool. This is this is the bit you edit out as Rick can't play. Have I ever played a game successfully while doing this? Okay, run, run, run. Ah, oh, dang. You're so back. you just run around. You're like, wonder, wonder what's up there. What is it? Why is there a water slide going into an empty pool with trampolines in it? Doesn't make sense. But it's just the joy of being the character, I think, for me, is a lot of what makes a sandbox game, a sandbox game. I'm trying not to move the mouse too quickly because I know, ah, oh, come on, get there, go, big jump, here we go, whoop de boo <laughs> Smash. So do you think the developers, by putting in this kind of point system, uh, do you think they're kind of inherently pushing you towards doing certain things? You know what, I think, I think pure sandbox games where there's no 
stuff to do. What? Get out of there. There's no, there's no objectives. I think that becomes a little bit dull after a while. So you need to have something in there so that players can have a, a reason to bonk into things. And a lot of this is to do with the, the achievements. So it's giving Sandbox a, a little bit of game structure on top of that. I think that becomes necessary after a while. Um, I don't think they've ruined it or broken it. I think they've just given more meaning to the exploration. But I could happily play this game for hours without worrying about those achievements. Really? So like, so... Oh, what's down there? There's no kind of ex existential threat kind of pushing you towards doing something. It's just kind of do whatever, whenever, for any reason. Yeah, and then, and then a list of achievements that kind of say, where are these achievements? Over here, quests. Quests, I guess they're called. So, yeah. um, you know, then, then it gives you it gives you a little bit of structure to Sandbox. I think a little bit of structure is useful, but, um, you know, the, I like the fact that there's not really a story. I like the fact that I can just get in there and start playing. I like the fact that for me as a... I can have that emergent gameplay um, appear. I think this is a big part of sandbox games. And if you want to just go knock down all of the posts and be like, that's the game I just made in my head. Yeah, I did it. That's cool. Or if the game is, let's see if I can headbutt a car and explode it, then that becomes the game. And so the sandbox world needs to have enough ammunition in there whoop, for me to be able to do these little weird quirky things. Oh, that's a good one. The bum drag. That's a very draggy dog. How do I do that? Draggy goat. Um, draggy goat. Oh. I guess I wasn't the first to think of it. Um, so I, I think the game gives me gives me ways just to explore and have fun. Let's see if I can lift this guy. No. You know, someone brought up Grand Theft Auto in the chat, and I think that's that's a really good example too. Because there's Grand Theft Auto Five is great because there's definitely like a good story there that you can kind of follow through. But some of the most fun I've had in that game is just doing exactly what you're doing as a goat, just doing random little things, going random places, exploring. Um, there's a there's a multiplayer mode in Grand Theft Auto, and you can like get your friend with you and just rob liquor stores, or like just do whatever you wanted to do, and it's it's a lot of fun just riding around. I think games can be sandbox plus plus. Woo! woo. <laughs> yeah, I think sandbox it doesn't have to be the entire genre, right? Sandbox can be like one of the partial genres that you're yes. you have sandbox elements, just like you have roguelike elements or procedural elements. Yeah. Would you say then it has multiple genres or hmm, that's interesting. I guess it doesn't really, it doesn't really matter. It's semantics, does it? Is yeah. sandbox a genre? Is sandbox a mode? Because you can have um, modes in games as well where you you have a sandbox mode and you just do whatever you want, cruise around. I think um, it's almost like a feature set, right? Or like a, a level of freedom in a way where it's it's kind of like a genre modifier, not so much a genre in itself, right? Because you have city builder sandbox games, you have survival, open world crafting uh, sandbox games. You have someone brought up. They asked, "What's the difference between an open world game and a sandbox game?" Yeah, uh, I think open world for me describes the um, the environment. So this game, I would say, is open world. There's no uh, there's no houses to go through. You're not gated. The, the main re right. the main thing with open world is you're not prevented from going from spot to spot. You know, there might be a couple of unlock areas or I just did have one, you know, load the new level thing I went through. My tongue is stuck to... <laughs> Yay! Um, but I think open world gives you the possibility and the ability to go wherever you want. You know, within reason, of course. I wonder what spot is. Within reason, of course. Um, whereas Sandbox, I think, is referring to the style of gameplay that you have. So um, this is both open world and Sandbox. GTA is open world. It has sandbox elements to it, which I guess all open world games have a sandbox element to it because you can just run around and do stuff. But I think for me, sandbox is a lot, a lot more about just go wherever you want, do whatever yeah. you want. Yeah. Looking at some of the latest Assassin's Creed games, like they're definitely open world, and they're sandbox in the fact that you can kind of pick which missions to go for, but they've really become like go to a marker on a map collect thing and for me that's not so much the kind of sandbox that i want in a game so i would say like it's a sandbox light like it's it's got choice in it of what objectives to pursue and it's open world so you can go anywhere 
in that regard. But um, yeah. I think the actual objectives themselves are like very kind of go here, do this, uh, at least in some of the later ones that I've played. But um, <laughs> you can ride a bike. This game is just entertaining just from the random yeah. stuff that you can do, right? Like it's very charming and the idea of a goat riding a bike is hilarious. So <laughs> even though it's clearly like very badly animated, that's part of the joke. This is part of the joke. Absolutely. Yeah. That's the joy in this game is the fact that it is kind of, it's so bad. It's good. It's one of those, but it's not trying to pretend to be anything else. And I think this is really important in any game that we're making. If you ugh, if you're trying to have something look realistic and sensible and uh, then um, and you don't quite get it right then people will will think it's a bad game but if you say right. well look it's first of all it's a goat so you already you're setting people's expectations that it's silly already i'm going to have one more shot at this stupid bike it's really hard yeah like it's really hard for someone to complain that the goat riding the bike doesn't look realistic yeah it's like you know what i mean like, like that's, that's not a like, valid criticism yeah. most of the time or you could just head bug a gas tank, okay. And if you're, for all the, you know, the budding game designers out there, aspiring game developers out there, wanting to make a sandbox game, I'd say the first thing to do is get your character just, just being joyful moving around or your your character or your team or your squad or whatever it is that you're trying to do. Oh, okay, they have that. Um, multiplayer, that'd be awesome. So get whatever it is that you're trying to do and have just joy in that. And so here I can see the developers would have just made a goat running around with some things in the world and just, I could see them just doing it for hours, just running around bashing into the things and saying, that's fun. What about if we put signs? Oh, that's fun as well. What about if when you hit them, you fall over? And then at some point they probably said, okay, let's, let's just add some points to give a little bit of structure so that, you know, you do this and I'll do that and it'll be interesting and fun. Um, but just start with the, the joy of moving. Can I go in this elevator? Oh my goodness. <laughs> and then from there, you can just have all these hidden kind of, oh, the music just started going crazy. Become like a Willy Wonka. Oh, I thought it went all crazy. Hello, you want to go flying? Woo! Are they playing like Twister <laughs> they, or is the party? How did this, why do they all just fall over? Oh, that's Domino's for you. <laughs> and. And you've got to have a, you've got to have a, um, I think, oh my goodness. <laughs> Knocking them off a bit. Wrong in so many ways. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know what this reminds me of is Katamari Damacy. That's, there's another weird game. Would you call that a uh, sandbox, Tim? Katamari. That's the one where you're like rolling and collecting things. You're rolling the ball. Yeah. Yeah. I, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I. Boop, boop, boop. What's gonna happen here? I really think sandbox for me means go anywhere, do anything, and I I think the do anything part is where Katamari falls short for me. Yeah. Because you really you can't you just do one thing. You go anywhere, but you do one thing. Can I get on that skateboard? Um. Yeah, you know what? I, I, I'm sure you've talked about this. I'll, I can stop this now unless you want to keep watching me run around as a goat. Um, <laughs> we've well, probably, I, explored, probably explored all there is to get out of this game. I mean, you, you run around and you just interact with stuff. That's the... Uh, that's but the there's a lot there. of interactions here. So like Moon Base, the game I showed, a lot of it was based on I need stuff. I need to survive, right? That was kind of my underlying motivation. I need power for the generator. I need oxygen for my suit. I need all this stuff. So that was kind of my sandbox stuff. I choose whatever I want to do, but it's generally based on that survival aspect of it. This is based on just pure entertaining yourself, right? Like yeah. all the weird stuff you can do, all the random interaction. You just went to a party and knocked a bunch of people off the roof. You've got in by a car, you've ridden a bike, and this is all in like 10 minutes. It's just, it's yeah. purely entertaining. It's got, it's got a sort of um, charming kind of uh, humor to it. Uh, my lights just flickered and there's a really bad lightning storm here. So hopefully I don't and, go offline. That's, that's really important that you've got to have a, a theme um, or, or a core experience you're trying to make for a player. So right. the, here, the experience is just silly, like just doing silly stuff as a goat. Um, right. The motivation is very different, right? That's what I was getting at is like the motivation to do this is very kind of intrinsic and exploratory yeah. where the motivation in the game I showed was very kind of survival. -y. And that creates two very different vibes of games. 
even though they're kind of both sandboxy. Yeah. I don't know if I would, yeah. It's really interesting. We can debate the semantics of what is or what isn't sandbox. It probably doesn't really matter that much. Um, but I think sandbox is where if you if you just goof around for half an hour, the game says, cool, no problem. You're allowed to do that. If you goof around for half an hour and the game says, no, no, you didn't, you didn't complete the thing to build the thing to get the thing, so therefore you die. That for me is no longer feeling sandboxy. That feels that um, you know it's it's maybe an open world, open structure type uh, type game, but it's not necessarily sandbox. Sandbox I feel is just do whatever you want, just play, just play. I think that's it about sandbox. Just play. Would you? Someone asked earlier, would you consider games like Factorio sandbox? No, I I, I wouldn't. Um, because you're, you, you can just goof around, but there's a very clear structure with Factorio where, um, you know, you, you're trying to progress. There's there's rules, there's um, upgrades, there's um, you, the the objective is a little bit clearer, I think. So I I wouldn't not that that's a bad thing. It doesn't have to be or not have to be sandbox, but I wouldn't personally I wouldn't call that sandbox. Because you're building something. I think when, you, when you're building some big structure, although it's saying that, I think one of the classic all-time sandboxes is Minecraft. Like that is just so sandbox. You just go and it's like playing with Lego. And you know, Lego is- That whole sandbox. game is about collecting and building. Minecraft? Yeah. Yeah, but it's not, it's not necessary to progress or to survive or um, to, to push along the story or any of that kind of stuff. You can just literally dig holes and build um you know build your little houses that's I a think good you point can still you're, you're not gonna and like here you're not building anything you're just running and moving and exploring uh, but i think sandbox can still be you know you've got well if you look at the literal definition of it it's trying to say that you're a kid in a sandbox with your shovel and you're just building little sand castles and that i think is where sandbox came from like literally the sand pit in the in the schoolyard yeah. Um, and so that is Minecraft. This this is a little bit, this is like getting your little cars as a kid and like, vroom, 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 look at me and vroom, I'm going to smash into your car. Uh, so I think any game that gives you that feeling, is, I'd call it sandbox. Yeah. And like, I would, along those same lines, like I would kind of argue that like, if we're getting really technical about the sandbox, like if a kid is in a sandbox and he doesn't use water to kind of build his sand castles, he's just going to have a giant pile of sand, right? Like he needs some kind of resource there to kind of uh, restrict what he can do. Otherwise it, you know, it's kind of useless. So I think the survival aspect for me doesn't really take away from the sandboxiness of it. I think it kind of it forces your brain to maybe move in one direction versus the other because you kind of yeah. gotta supply that generator supply your oxygen tank whatever but i still think it you still have the choice to kind of do whatever it's just going to ultimately cause different things to happen uh which <laughs> you know he's having a good time oh. <laughs> <laughs> that was the biggest fail in the history i'm like this guy is just oh come on get away from me i can't get up now He's just begging for it. He's like, come on, please just smash me over the edge. And I missed him with my head, but whoop. Oh, that was pretty <laughs> anticlimactic. Anyway. Well, I think he survived and you didn't. That's, uh... Why do you guys think so narrow about sandbox? I think sandbox is a trait rather than a genre. For example, Skyrim is a sandbox RPG. Sandbox is contained in the context of such world. Yeah, that's what we've been saying this whole time, man. <laughs> like, we both agree with that. Like, we definitely think it's a... Uh... It's a feature set. It's a series of qualities. Yeah. We're just getting I, I lost in the semantics of specifically what a sandbox is. I know. It's probably not that useful for us to debate semantics. It's like, what does it, what does it matter? Um, ultimately, I think if you want to make a game that has emergent gameplay, that's super important, I think, for certain types of games where people can just yeah. be like, you know, boo -boo, I did a thing. Look what I built. Oh, I exploded it. Wow. And then I did this and that and that. And then it, it whatever. Um, I think emergent gameplay is a really key part of allowing players just to yes. make the game themselves to discover to be excited and it might be like well how do you how do you design in emergent gameplay i think that the best way to do that is to start with your character in your world you know you're in unity or unreal or godot or whatever you're in you're playing around the character's kind of fun and you say okay what extra 
tool or toy can I put in here that the player can discover and use? And players love exploits. Oh, we've got the spam in the chat. Players love exploits as well. So you can put something in there where they're like, you know what? I can run through the wall and get to the other side. And I don't think the game meant for me to do that. But when I do it, it's funny and it's interesting. And I'm going to post online and people are going to say, you legend for figuring it out. So uh, I think that kind of leaving in those little those little issues, not that it, no bugs that break the game, but bugs that allow you to do fun stuff like Goat Simulator. You know, your head can clip through the wall. Your head can spin around like 720 degrees. You can, the yeah. ragdoll can get broken. That's fun because when you discover it as a player, you, you think that was me. That's pretty nifty. How exciting. Uh, so I think yeah. that's that's really cool to do. Um, but you just put the put if people aren't discovering if they're not making up their own little game or their own rules or they're they're having fun playing then you need to add another tool in there that doesn't need to be an entire new feature set but say for example you've got some obstacles and you can shoot the obstacles and they explode that's cool what about if when you shoot them and they explode uh, everything gets pushed back or what about if you have seven of them next to each other? Or what if the player can pick up those obstacles and stack them next to each other and then explode them and have something happen? Uh, or what if you can you know, have them around the corner? So if it's multiplayer, someone else runs around the corner and you go boom, just as they run around the corner. So that kind of, that kind of play, you're not trying to get a, a kill. You're not trying to win, capture the flag. You're just saying, hey, what if, we, what if we can just bump each other and I can bump you off the ledge and that's funny. Yeah, there, there's two other th- parts of sandbox that I want to talk about briefly too, because I think we've got a little bit of time. Um, the first is sandboxing during development. And the second is like sandbox meaning from an actual pers- marketing perspective too. So first of that sandboxing during development, one of the most effective ways that I found to actually design games, especially um, linear games or games that have enemy types and all that stuff is to kind of sit down in a sandbox environment and just design enemy types and have them kind of all work together. I may even create like a sandbox level where I just kind of dump all of my enemy types in to kind of test and stuff like that. And I've often referred to that as, as kind of sandboxing, even though it's not so much sandbox games. Um, putting a bunch of stuff from a dev perspective in with each other and kind of seeing how it reacts and working on the stuff and building the stuff and changing stuff helps you find some of the emergent gameplay and some of the interactions between the different systems and stuff like that. And it can help you make better sandbox games uh, overall by kind of looking at everything inside the same sandbox and how it all works together and how it interacts. It's also really good at finding bugs too, because some stuff just doesn't seem to work together for whatever reason. Um, The other part of that from the marketing perspective is regardless of what we think sandbox games are, what sandbox games mean to us, we need to keep in mind that if we launch a game on Steam and we tag it with sandbox, that's going to mean something to somebody, right? And we have to really understand what that tag means from their perspective to make sure that they don't feel misled or they don't instantly refund your game. So our little definition of sandboxing is less important than kind of like the overall understanding of what customers generally um, want from your game when you tag it with sandbox. So that's important to keep in mind. We were talking about elements and and the go anywhere, do anything philosophy. And it's more of like a genre modifier type of deal than a genre in itself. It's more of like a a thing that you add on uh, into your game. um, And it kind of represents that kind of stuff. So it's just important to keep in in mind when when you're talking about your game using those terms. There's a question, are there any techniques devs can use to encourage, well, let me put it on the screen rather than just doing it. Are there any techniques devs can use to encourage players to discover emergent gameplay moments? I feel like a common complaint with these games uh, is players are not sure what to do. I think that is the risk that you run if you have a pure sandbox game. And we reviewed or we went through one of these games um, a few weeks ago, the game that was, you just build that little city and you're not trying to do anything. You're just kind of building a city. Um, I think you do need to give the player enough explanation of what's going on. So if you say to them, just play, like see if you can break stuff. They're like, oh, okay, that's what I'm, that's what I'm doing here. But if you don't tell them anything at all and they're running around saying, where's the door? Am I looking for a door? Am I trying to kill someone? Are there any keys? What am I doing? Why am I here? But if you say to them, you're just exploring and breaking stuff, then they're like, oh, okay, well, I'm exploring and breaking stuff. I'll see if I can have some fun doing that. So you need to give people a little bit of structure, I think, uh, in terms of what you're trying to do. 
uh, I don't think it hurts in a sandbox game to have like Goat Simulator had achievements. So just jumping, it's like, oh, you got an achievement. Oh, okay, I guess this game is about just do whatever I want and I happen to randomly get some achievements. And if at some point I get bored just running around bumping into stuff, I'll go pay attention to the achievements and I'll go try to conquer that. So the game uh, still has a sandbox flow to it, but I now have structure in terms of what I'm trying to achieve. And I think Minecraft does that very well as well. You, oh, I can dig. Oh, I can build a thing. And then the game doesn't necessarily say you must go do this, but because there's crafting and because there's uh, discovering things and there's getting resources, the game's kind of saying, okay, here's some elements. Try to figure out what you do with them. Uh, and it's guiding you through that process of discovering your own game within a rule set but it's not mandating you must do this first, you must do this second, then you must do that. I think that's a really important aspect of this sandbox play Yeah, is you're not mandated the order or, or mandated on exactly how you go about playing the game. The, the other part of that is the motivation is super, super important, right? So in Goat Simulator, like you showed us, there's this sort of like, I want to entertain myself kind of motivation of like, what happens if I knock a dude off a roof? What happens if I run straight into a car? Um, so there's like this novelty that comes from just experimenting. Um, there's a lot of different motivation types and different motivation types work for different players. But that part is super important too. And I think one of the things that Minecraft did fantastically well was it gave you a very interesting world, right? So like you can dig down, there are these creatures, there are these like little Pikmin dudes that come out of nowhere. But if you dig down, then like suddenly you can find caverns and you can find lava and you can find these crystals and then it's it ties like the whole loot box box aspect of like i could find something really rare and valuable if i just dig a little bit longer it was very compelling to just explore it by default right and i think you could give the player the same tools without that kind of sense of wonder in that world and it just it would just be like i don't know what to do right like same players would just be like uh oh, this doesn't i don't i don't really understand this and i think that's where a lot of developers fall short is this especially with sandbox games in general is they create sandboxy type of things i played a lot of uh games for feedback friday that like people have sent to me but really they're kind of just like tech demos sandboxy tech demos that don't really have any objectives in them and because they haven't really worked on that player motivation to kind of pull me through what it is that i'm playing it feels flat it just feels unfinished and it feels empty you know yep so Stuff's we had important. a question uh, had a question do you think stanley parable is uh sandbox just trying to just trying to load the game without it breaking my computer give me a second oh, oh. <laughs> this is so nerve-wracking talk about achievements Stanley Parable has a achievement to not open it for five years. Oh, aspect ratio. There we go. Um, okay, so any second now, if you want to, Tim, if you'd be so literally kind. have uh, Unity build titled Sandbox specifically for that purpose. Oh, sweet! So you're already ahead of the game with this whole sandboxy deal. Um, you're loading up Stanley Parable. Yep, just just have a quick look at it so people, okay. if they're like, what is that about? Would you be able to? No? Oh, man. Uh, Sergeant Flex says, I remember trying to create sandbox games early on in Unreal and seems like a tons of Unreal subreddit too, but the scope becomes overwhelming. What do you think about the difficulty of creating them? I think sandboxy games tend to be systemic games. Systemic games tend to require a lot of systems that interact with each other. Whenever you build a lot of systems that interact with each other, it's a lot of work. Uh, I think that's the inherent nature of sandboxiness in general. Um, I think that's just the way that it is. So this is Stanley Parable. I'd say no, it's not a sandbox because it's very, very heavily story driven. You can't hear it at the moment, which is a bit dumb, but we've got the narrator is talking over the top saying, you know, Stanley worked in an office. Sorry, I wasn't listening because I was chatting to you guys. Stanley worked in an office and for example, wasn't sure where to go. And then you run down here to the end and at some point the narrator is going to say some more stuff um it, it's a fun game because the level kind of wraps and it, you get in this little time machine of where do i go have i just gone here you loop around a bunch but here the narrator is about to say that i've got a choice of two doors so stanley came to a set of two open doors 
and and so you have to decide which one to go through and so i think this is really a, a story puzzle narrative based game where um you're discovering can i go in that door no nope. um you're discovering where to progress and you're listening to the narrator and and there there is a a start in the middle and an end there's multiple endings to it so i wouldn't say this is a sandbox because i can't just get there and and you know play around with these chairs and i can't just get there and and write on the wall or i, I can't build something out of yeah. these things really paying attention to the narrator um you know at the moment the narrator is telling me that something about stanley and his colleagues and where has everyone gone and you can see that there's a there's a deck on the screen we love decks don't we um <laughs> And so it's a great game, but I wouldn't call it sandbox. So I just wanted to show that if anyone hasn't played Stanley Parable, uh, so you actually get the context of this conversation. So, you know, you mentioned um, that, that it's got a beginning, middle, and end kind of deal. And I actually think one of the things that sandbox games kind of suffer from is the ending. It's really hard to end a game that's kind of go anywhere, do anything, right? Mm -hmm. Like the success criteria is kind of weird. And I think a lot of games have tried a lot of different things. I don't think any ending i've ever played really has just been like felt good to me right it's kind of just a lot of the sandbox games that i played are kind of just like you play till you get sick of it and you just kind of leave your save and never or touch it, it again you play you play until you launch a rocket into outer space and it, it's something like that yeah in, in a way it's cool like that's a very sim city uh, or factorio did that as well you know the whole why am i doing why am i just building and building and building and building are oh, you launching a rocket one day you know civilization launching a rocket yeah. one day but the, a lot of those games they they struggle with the ending and i think yeah. like they kind of just that that always felt like an afterthought to me like i understand it but then one it doesn't feel like super coherent but then two when you do it it's almost like a sense of loss sometimes because it's like now but i wanted to go back and like build my stuff like why do i gotta like the game just ended. What if I wanted to, you know? So I think the way a lot of the uh, games get around that is they'll have modes, they'll have endless mode, they'll have, um, you know, types of modes. Sometimes they have creative mode in like Minecraft, for example, where they remove the restrictions and survival yeah. aspect of it. Well, and that's a good a way of, to get around it, but it's just something you got to keep in mind. A lot of city builders have that that problem. We're mentioning SimCity. Also Banished, I found that as well. You kind of... You get to the point where you, you sort of you figure out the game you're going well you've built it up pretty big you've got maybe you've got a little bit of that tension between when i grow things get too difficult so i have to shrink and grow and shrink and you get into that sort of that area or you just kind of max it out and you're like i've got a million billion trillion things in right here. and i think i think the joy of those sorts of games is they're saying there doesn't need to be an ending so there's a little bit of for the people who hunger for an ending they don't get it but I think that is when you start jumping online and saying, what are other people doing with their game? And it's not so much about having an ending, but having a an accomplishment. So people saying, okay, well, I built 72, you know, power stations in my city. And that meant that every, you know, every citizen had 1 million, whatever, um, you know, computers they're carrying around with them. Wow, look at that. So you see someone else achieves that particular thing and you go chase that. And as as game developers, if we can have the community create those achievements and create that sense of they did that, I'll see if I can do that as well. That's way, I think, way more powerful than me having to code in the achievements to figure them out myself. Because then you get this emergent community gameplay going on and your game, I think, expands a lot more than if you have it just baked in. Okay, I've got 50 achievements in the game. When you do the 50 achievements, I guess that's the end of the game, unless I go and code in, do some DLC or do a patch and get some more achievements in there. But if the community starts to say, I did this and I did that, then that's when it can really expand. I think you can have a, a, a larger commercial success on your hands. Totally. And I think, I, I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing that like, you know, a story driven narrative game would have an ending and then you're, it's over and then you're done. Uh, whereas a sandbox game most of the time wouldn't. But it does mean that usually when players fall off of it, they fall off of it in the middle of building a city or in the middle of exploring or whatever. And they, it, the way that they exit is a little bit different. But I also think that's an opportunity too because I've played plenty of games where I've played them for an hour and when people bring them up, I'm like, oh, I played that. It was a great game, right? Like I never finished it. I never got super far, but I played it enough to entertain myself with it. And I don't really care about the ending you know, like I don't care about getting that far. I just care about entertaining myself for that hour that I had to kill or whatever. Yeah. 
Yeah, and that comes back to the different segments of people who will be playing your game, the different modes of your game. And ultimately, if you give someone a fun experience for a number of hours, then mission accomplished. That's what we're trying to achieve, you know, a, a compelling experience. Um, so did they finish it? Did they beat it? Did they win it? It doesn't really matter. Some people are going to yeah. be very passionate about that. But in a way, it's good to say you could finish it if you want to, but you don't have to. Um, as opposed yeah. to saying, I don't know how you finish my game. You kind of don't. Some people feel a bit empty with that. Having some sort of ending is almost like an accessibility type of deal because some players like to have the ending and some players don't. And I think that's really where those modes come in, right? Like there's plenty of people in Minecraft that just like the building aspect. They don't like the survival yeah. aspect. So by just creating creative mode, which, you know, is not a big workload compared to actually building the game, uh, just adding a different mode in there is can actually, you know, in some cases it can like double your audience because you've got a whole nother set of players now that will come back to it uh, without the elements they don't like. So I think that's important. Yeah. I, I'm also, I've been playing a lot of Risk of Rain 2 of late and it's a, you know, run around, shoot, kind of roguelike from the point of view of insta-death. And the way it addresses that is um, you play through a certain number of levels. I think it's five levels or five stages. And then on the fifth one, you fight the boss. If you beat the boss, you win. That's it. You win the whole game. Game over. You have to start again. But if you don't want to have that that short of an experience, because uh, the game gets more and more difficult, you get more and more powerful. Like as each minute goes by, the game's getting you know harder, and you're getting more powerful. And so uh, what it says is you can you can go around the boss, and you can loop, and you can go back to the start, and you can loop as many times as you're capable of doing. And when you loop back to the start again, there everything's way more difficult, and you're way more powerful. So you have that fun of saying, okay, I beat the game the way it was. You know, it gave me an experience where through through a 45 minute or one hour gameplay, I beat the game, great. But what happens, I'd like to play for two hours. I'd like to see if I could play for three hours. And so you can have that option and it's built right into the game, but it's not done in a way that is, you know, select your option. Would you like to uh, play against the boss or would you like to try to right. win the game? You have to figure that out. You have to go on the forums. You have to watch the YouTubers, people discover it. You discover it yourself, you unlock things. So there's that that community discovery that I think is a lot of the reason that game's doing so well is people talk about, oh, I found a thing. Or if you do this, or, you know, here are the best characters to use. Do you, how important do you think that the procedural generation is in a mode like that? Do you think it's like necessary um, to do that? Well, interesting, Risk of Rain 2, um, in terms of terrain, it doesn't have procedural generation. It has different levels. So maybe it's got double the number of layouts or levels that you would see in a playthrough. So you don't know, am I going to get level one? Which level one am I going to get? That one or that one? Uh, um, gotcha. So okay. there's some randomness in there with, with the environment. So that keeps you on your toes a little bit. There's also some choice. So I can do a couple of things. And then instead of going you know, from level two to level three, I can go from level two to this kind of in between world and then i can go from the in between world to fight in a different level three so i get that choice of how i guide it uh, and then the the procedural the randomness comes from um where the enemies spawn out which enemies get spawned what items pick up etc so there's a lot of variation without necessarily needing um, like procedural generation which i see procedural generation is typically going to be world building um you know or joining things together but this is more randomness of spawning gives you the joy makes sense yeah they got a great gdc video on how they did levels in dead cells i think i've seen that one i think it was pretty good um yeah cool so um tim what about we've got lots of great questions coming in from everyone at the moment so if we highlight that please throw any questions you have at us about games, game design, you know, level design, about um, sandbox, about other genres of games. But also if you've got anything about your own career or learning journey, then throw them in there now. We'll give you, give you a bit of our time to see if we can come up with some answers for that. So let us know if you've got any questions. Um, Tim, yeah. I have a question for you. How lonely was it for the first 20 minutes when I couldn't figure out how to make a computer work? Versus very long how amazing was it that you didn't have some rambly Australian fool going blah, no, blah, blah. I missed the rambly Australian fool because it's really hard to play a game 
survive in the game and analyze the game while live streaming. Those and, and are watch all the chat comments saying, yes. you, know, you suck at this game. <laughs> yes. There are several times where like I paused to talk and like my bar was just ticking down and I was like, uh oh. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. more difficult to do the whole Twitch streamer thing um, than it might seem at first glance, I think. Yeah, it is. He um, cried. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Let's just put that on the screen. So uh... <laughs> <laughs> I waited. I waited for you, Rick. I'm really glad you came, though. Um, yeah. Well, thank you. I'm glad to be here. Drake Dude yeah. asks Can a leaderboard be a way to add more points to a game, like for speedrunning? I think so. Yeah. I think we, we have to be careful not to be caught up with it must be a pure sandbox. It's like, just do whatever feels good, honestly. Just, and to your point, Tim, if you label it on Steam as a particular genre, a particular type of thing, you want to make sure you give that. But if you like, if you yourself play your game, you have a couple of friends play your game, some people in our community play the game, and you say, hey, what do you think about a leaderboard? And they're like, oh, that'd be cool. Or if people are playing it saying, I got 100, what did you get? I, I don't know, I think I got 90. Did you beat me? I beat you. If people are wanting to get a bit competitive about it, then a leaderboard is great. Yeah. A, a leaderboard in Risk of Rain 2 wouldn't make sense. I, I would just... It, it, it's not needed, so you don't need to put it in there. But a leaderboard in a game where you're getting, like, the point is to get a score. What score did I get? I, I think a leaderboard is cool for that. Yeah. I, I'd also think in terms of, like, what is a leaderboard supposed to do? And generally, it let, lets people compare their score to other people to kind of know where they stand in kind of the hierarchy. But there are a lot of other ways to do that as well. I think one of my favorite recent examples is Wordle. Um, it allowed you to kind of share an image of uh, how many tries you had and kind of where you got the different letters without revealing the the daily word for the Wordle. I thought that was fantastic yeah. because people always share their kind of uh, image over and over again on social media and all these places. And then a bunch of people are like, hey, what's this? Right? Yep. Yeah. So you can brag and say, I got it in two, but without revealing um, any spoilers. Right. Yeah, so that's that's really cool. And it's, it would be better in the leaderboard in that case because it helped the game go viral, right? It got so popular at one point in my uh, Discord community, we had to create an entire channel for Wordle just because people were flooding the off topic with their, their Wordle thing. Um, Proper Duck Games on Twitch asks, what's the number one reason that makes you quit working on a game? For me, I would say scope. Scope is by far the the single reason I've quit games. Um, I like to make games. I make a lot of games. I haven't in the last year or so, but you know, I've made a couple dozen games and uh, almost always when I quit, it's because the game has gotten uh, too big for me. I think the other part of it is because of my experience with scope. Now I can kind of identify when a game's going to have a larger scope, even before I kind of get knee deep in it. And so a lot of times I will shelve games knowing what the scope is going to require before I even kind of head down that route. Um, but I like to prototype a lot, so that kind of makes sense. I think for me, the, the thing that has me quit working on a game is when I solve the initial what's fun about this game, and then it just becomes a conversation about content. So what I mean by content is more characters, more levels, more story, more... Yeah progression the slog so if, if i'm trying to make a like for example i quite enjoyed making the the tilevania game so in our 2d unity course we have a um showing how to use tile map in unity really enjoyed it here's the platform here's the character it took a lot of time getting the jump feeling good and here's the jump distance and i have a thing there and a thing there and oh i can jump from there and have some spikes and land on the spikes that's cool so i'm like yeah this game feels kind of cool now uh okay, now I just need to go and turn it into a, whatever, a five hour experience with enough levels and enough enemies, enough progression and enough cool kind of um, content puzzly challenges. Oh, I don't want to do that. So I, I think for me, I'm a, I'm a serial prototyper is what I've always had throughout my entire career. Come up with the idea, prototype the mechanics, play around with it. So the moment feels good. And when I've done that, I'm like, that, that's it. That's, that's the game. I'm happy with that. I don't really feel compelled to turn it into to that commercial yeah. experience where it's got enough oomph in it to be able to sell. Um, and maybe it's because I find that that's the hard part as well. You know, you spend... It is. It is. 
hundred percent. It's it that that what you're. And that's exactly where I'm at with Battleborn, by the way. Because <laughs> <laughs> like I've got the game done. I just need like all the modes and the progression and the meta progression and the options menu and all the, all the stuff, you know. Uh, and it that is the slog between uh, the fun designy stuff and launch yeah. day. And it's just so much stuff. And then you take into account a lot of the stuff that happens like pre or post launch, like barely pre or post launch, which is like localization updates, platforms. Yeah, that stuff is just soul sucking, man. Like nobody wants yeah. to sit there and like port a game to like a different platform and make the UI look slightly different and add different. But that's just not game design to me, right? That's just like boring yeah. programming stuff. So 100%, yeah, you know, have to be careful with that. If you want to actually launch a game, you have to really understand how big of a deal that is. It's it's a really good point. Many, many years ago, like goodness me, nearly 15 years ago now, um, I went off to game design school. It was a game design program, one of the best in the world. And halfway through, or not even that, early on, uh, all of those in, in my intake, in my class, realized wait wait a minute we're not actually doing much design here we're not talking about all the things we were just reviewing in in the games just now we're not talking about character progression we're not talking about um cool mechanics we're not talking about emergent gameplay i think this is a game production course and so the the industry veterans who are teaching it they understood well you need to understand how the art pipeline works you need to make your own 3d graphics so that you understand that's how making 3d graphics work you need to have done a texture so you get it you know just how long and how difficult it is to do texture yeah. you need to know some programming so all of these things learning learning about how games get made was basically game production and and which was fine because i came into that that and i became a producer and i was managing people to do all the process but i think a lot of indies don't realize necessarily the game production side of making games yeah. that you need to go and have a conversation with an artist or you need to learn how to make 3d art or you need to go buy your assets and then you know maybe modify them a little bit and you need to understand how to integrate your audio assets and you need to name all your files a particular way and you need to understand how to do that QA process and how to post and how to do the marketing. So all of those things I think is game production, which is which a lot of people get a lot of joy out of game production. People who are very organized, people who like to manage processes yeah, um, and people who like to build processes. Whereas those folks who are a little bit more I'm a designer. I like to come up with the idea, I think. And that's a little bit maybe more like you and I, Tim. We love to, yeah. to solve that problem of what would be a compelling experience. Then production becomes a little bit of a drag. And then I think there's another bucket of people in our community who are programmers to like the, who, who really enjoy that technical challenge of, okay, we need to have a character spin around seven times when you push a button. Hmm, how am I going to do that in the code? Getting into the code and this is how you do that. Da, 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 da. That's, you know, my code is done, beautiful, you can spin around. And then someone says, cool, well, what about the other characters? Oh, I don't want to do art. I don't want to manage a production pipeline and, and so yeah. on. So I think if you want to be a professional, as in do this and make a living out of it, then you need to either team up with someone who has that skill set or just kind of, you know, hold your nose and jump into the, the cold water and do it yourself. Um, or if, if you're saying, well, I just love the part that I love, then you can be a hobbyist. You can enter game jams. You can focus on just the bit you enjoy and just do that and not worry about yeah. trying to squeeze a career out of making games. Just just get the joy of creation out of it. 100%. Speaking of uh, squeezing the careers out of making games, are we ever going to do a marketing course or workshop again? Yeah, if there's if there's interest, why not? If enough of you guys would like us to do that. I, th I thought it was pretty good. Um, we had fun. I think we still have uh, the, our private little Discord channel where a lot of people help each other out and share Steam launches. And we did all the Steam Fest together. We had a group of us. So it was a really good workshop. I had a lot of fun yeah possibly yeah. yeah that's the that's the answer maybe probably if if there's there's some what other workshops would you guys like us to do like a career workshop a game design workshop level design workshop um you know a, more of an advanced programming workshop and when i say workshop i mean you know over the weekend two days on a weekend where we just we're here for four or five hours each day let's just get deep into something and work through it yeah. together lots of questions and answers and and interaction and okay now you guys do this and 
and and a, a deeper experience, more hands-on experience, I think, than working through a course. For sure. And we covered a lot of topics that aren't straight up technical, right? It's not like write this line to program this game. It was more like how to launch your game, how to do marketing, business, all that kind of stuff. All yeah. the kind of weird stuff that kind of goes behind the scenes that nobody gets. Yeah. Multiplayer workshop. Mm, well, that sounds like the most comprehensive <laughs> and complex. <laughs> it might Step be there one, for a while. Players. Step two, push play. Yeah. And make a multiplayer board game workshop. That'd be easier. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'd like you to look at more of the Game Jam games. Cool. From Marcus. Um, network, multiplayer, um, more mobile workshops. It's really interesting. I think. Um, I assume you mean talking about mobile games as opposed to a mobile workshop where Tim and I turn up in a truck and we're <laughs> like, yeah, get in the back. Hey, I've got a good truck. Workshop. We can do it in. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's really interesting. A lot of our community is very PC slash Steam centric. Um, and we tend not to focus a lot on how to succeed with mobile games. Um, yeah. Be a thing. A lot of the technical disciplines are very similar for a PC game versus a mobile game, right? Like building the game is, I would say, other than the input method, 80 to 90% the same process. So um you know there's not much there technically but then when you get to mark mobile marketing it's drastically different right like it's completely utterly like 80 90 percent different yeah. so it's kind of complicated to to cover that in those yeah. both and of those ways what, tim full disclosure here i've become very annoyed with the mobile game industry because of all the scamminess and the trickery that's out there, and um, I've kind of had a little bit of my little bit of my love has been broken because I was working on mobile games and I was in a studio that made mobile games, free to play games, and there is there is an inherent aspect of so much of that 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 not genre that that um, modality of making games where we say here's a fun game experience, how can we make the most money possible from each person? So instead of saying, here's a thing, we've built a, a thing, uh, we think $10 is a reasonable exchange of our time and labor with someone else's capital, uh, which is the way it happens with mostly with Steam games. But we say, you know what, let's make it free. And then our goal is to get $1,000 from someone or hundreds of dollars from someone, or each week we get another $100 out of them. That becomes the whole, the whole monetization game. Uh, which for me, I, d I don't enjoy that conversation. I think there's a value. You know, obviously we've put a year of blood, sweat and tears into this. We want to get properly compensated for our development time and effort. But I don't think having one person spend lots and lots of money and other people spend zero money, that doesn't feel as good for me. And now obviously there's a lot of other different monetization models for mobile games. Uh, the one that I favor the most is the the try before you buy. So give someone a smaller experience. Maybe it's the first 10 minutes of the game. Maybe it's one level. Maybe it's uh, you know half of the features. And then saying to them, if you enjoy this, then spend the money to get the full experience. That's I like that. That makes sense on mobile because people don't yeah. they don't just pay untested on mobile. Um, so yeah, there's there's other ways to do it, but there's so much sort of skullduggery and trickery i find within mobile development marketing monetization uh, etc i i've kind of gravitated towards the more pure indie game jam steam yeah. itch io way of doing things here's the thing it costs ten dollars if you if you buy it for ten dollars and you don't like it i'll give you your money back that for me is just there's a purity yeah. to that that feels more more nintendo and less um zynga if that makes sense you know what's kind of sad about the whole thing though is because you brought up nintendo as a, the ultimate example of like games like that but i've been seeing switch decline so much into mobile territory there are so many like straight up mobile game ports and now granted they usually port them without the in-app purchases and stuff like that but they're just they feel the whole store is just kind of flooded with garbage in my opinion just like stuff that's that's not there and it really really sucks because every couple months i usually 
uh, try to download a few mobile games on my phone. Like I'll go through and like I want to play a certain type of game, so I'll search the Play Store or whatever, and I'll search. And almost always, I'm disappointed because it's always the same kind of thing. Like I'll play it for five minutes, and then they introduce gems, and I need gems to do my thing, and the gems cost money, and it's just like why like i will literally pay you money if you could just give me 10 minutes of interesting fun of trying to sell me shit like 100 yeah. percent, i'll buy your game just i just you know it's more profitable though you know and it's um, everything's driven with capitalistic intentions and so numbers on a spreadsheet lead you to make decisions based on those numbers it's very different than how I think indies in general kind of design a lot of games these days, which is more from an intuitive design from the heart kind of deal. Yes. You know? Yeah. And, and I think the way indies make games that are, you know, PC or, or just, you know, game jam type games. Um, I think it's a case of saying, here's the things you like it or not. If you like it, I'll do more of it. If you don't, I'll do less of it. Whereas in free to play games, and that's not strictly mobile. There's also, you know, a lot of, very successful um, PC online free to play games. Um, but the conversation isn't, hey, did you like this thing? Did you get joy out of it? It is what made us more money? What made us more money and had people stick around? So the right. two went hand in hand. You need to pay attention to retention. That's very important. So people do need to enjoy and get a, a fun experience out of what you're giving to them. But that in a non free to play game that's it that's do people love it and stick around job done that's what we're trying to go for here you know youtubers are going to play it people will talk about it will make more money because more people buy it but then you have the additional conversation in free to play which is okay now we're going to get some money out of these folks and that for me is it's valid you know if you've got a business you need to make money and if you've got a product people are willing to pay for then you shouldn't be ashamed of asking people for money at any point like it's very very important but for me I then feel myself no longer being a game designer. I feel myself being a uh, like a, a product manager, where it's all about right. how do we how do we massage the conversation yeah. so that we we make this you know this sword's cool. It'll kill monsters, but okay, let's let's make it limited edition. Let's have it so it it has the best graphics, better than the other graphics. Let's have it that has a bonus that other people don't get, um, and let's charge. I don't know. What do we think we can get for this? I think we can get $8 for this sword. Okay, let's go do that. And that for me um, is it's a totally valid career as well if you if you enjoy that sort of stuff. And there's not a problem with selling a sword for $8. Like absolutely, if people want to pay it, then they're clearly getting $8 worth of joy out of that. I'm just doing, this is a personal opinion of mine that I don't like selling a sword for $8. I'd rather give people, you know, joy of experience and say, look, this whole thing was worth $30. Please give me $30 for the whole thing, but I'm not going to try to nickel and dime you out of another yeah. dollars for a sword. I, I think, you know, it gets seen even, even into darker territory when you've launched a game, you're working on a game, you're looking at the numbers and you say, oh, that sword is selling really well at eight. Like, I wonder if we could make something for 20 and you go from yeah. 20 to 50 to 100 to 1,000 and you optimize these numbers because you're clearly making revenue. But what you don't realize that you're doing is is you're playing into people with addictive personalities. You're playing into people that have like major life problems and they need escapism. They need all this kind of stuff. The, you don't understand. You're optimizing for numbers, but each one of those numbers represents a human behind the, the wall that you can't see. And I think a lot of times those extreme number optimizations create real world problems. And I think we're, we're seeing it in, in social media too, like the algorithms, people optimizing for views and clicks. Uh, they're creating these clickbait articles, which is pushing people to, you know, be very hostile towards each other. They're creating these bubbles uh, that people click on, but then it just refeeds you the same thing that you believe, which makes your beliefs, you know, a little more um, hostile and less resistant to change. Um, there's a lot of problems with optimizing for purely data when we are like emotional human creatures that have, you know, thoughts and feelings and ideas and all this stuff, because those numbers can can give a distorted view of what's actually happening. I, I'm i really interested as well, people watching at the moment or, or popping into the comments later on. Have you ever played or been playing a game and thought, this is not a good use of my time. I shouldn't be doing this and feeling guilty or feeling bad about the fact that oh, I've got other things that I should be doing right now. 
I shouldn't be playing this game. I kind of feel bad about it, but I'm going to keep playing it because I just kind of want to want to finish the level or or my friends are all online. I just don't want to stop playing yeah. or um, I, I just want to finish it on. But I'm having so much fun. This is way better than going to the other things I should do. Uh, like for me, I get that all the time because I... You know, I'll play longer than I should. I'll just play a game, you know, just relax for an hour. <clears throat> and then it's two hours or three hours and it's, you know, midnight. Oh, I should have gone to bed. I have to be up at six in the morning. And now I'm not getting enough sleep and I'm going to have a toll on my body. So sometimes I have that connection between playing the game and this sense of guilt of I should be doing something else. And I think that is, <clears throat> that's the part of games that I think the mainstream media likes to talk about because folks who who go further down that extreme of okay i i'm enjoying playing this game it's all good everyone's happy but i've now played it every single day for the last two years for eight hours a day and things aren't going so well so you know this yeah. is not i don't think this is a, a right or wrong it's not games necessarily but i think as game developers we need to have an awareness of that whole conversation and for sure what role we play that's Sorry. that's a perfect example of what i meant though is because like you optimize for player retention for example right so you in introduce people said in the chat like daily quests right or quests that expire or these things that you can only get this week or these like limited time things but what you end up doing is you make the player feel like they have to play instead of wanting yeah. to play right like they have to sign in and do that daily quest or they have to sign in and do those things or they miss out one of my favorite games of all time is destiny but Destiny implemented a seasonal model where you you buy this season for, I think it lasts like two months, and they've got all this content, but you have to play practically every day to get through the seasonal content, to get to the end game weapons. And then once that season is over, you never get that content again. So they had like this fear of missing out and then this requirement to kind of dedicate your time to it. So I felt like I have to play and then I have to get the season stuff and I have to do all that stuff just to remain competitive with everyone else. Otherwise, the people don't want to do the raids with me, right? Because I don't have the same gear that they have. And so yeah. it's like this whole social thing. And it's just, I started feeling bad, man. I was just like, this game doesn't make me feel good anymore. It just makes me feel like like I, I need to do this. Like it's a job and it yeah. just, it's, it's kind of toxic to to go in that and then you you add that in with like microtransactions and stuff like that where like they make you feel bad intentionally so that you just buy that thing instead of you know working for it and then it's just like a whole another level of of stuff that you know yeah there's a lot of negative game design stuff we could i'm sure we could be here all day talking about that stuff yeah yeah, I, I'm, yeah. I, I'm curious as well if i think this this community and the folks who come along and join us on the live cast I think a, a lot more mature, um, mature slash older slash more progressed in, in their opinions on these things. We don't have, um, you know, a whole bunch of people who are just absolutely brand new to thinking about the conversation or, or are super young. And so I think we've got a pretty introspective community on this front. And, and I often wonder about this, where we're making games, we need to be mindful of how we make them. I think and there was a, just another question here about sandbox games and um and um important uh for sandbox games it is important to respect the player's time because they often don't have uh they often have to make their own fun which can lead to their experience feeling pointless etc so, so, yeah so i think to wrap it all back into this conversation about sandbox games i think if you give people here's stuff to play with just play have a good time but not to deliberately do it in a way that says okay when you finish this, we're going to make a big deal about how you need to get that next thing or else you're going to feel really bad. You're going to feel empty in your heart if you don't keep going and progressing and making the whole way through. And so I think there's a real challenge for good game design because a lot of what we're taught is how to have people not leave your game, how to have them want more, how to have them stay here forever. And I think there's a little bit of, hmm, let's see if we can be smarter than that and say to someone, um, whenever you need to have some fun or relax or have a different experience this is here for you and it's going to be great and you can start and stop very easily you can save yeah. very easily you can pick up very easily there's no such thing as once you start you're locked in for the next four hours because if you leave you know you lose everything so i think there's some things that we can do to say if you have the time you can stay for four hours and have a great time 
But if you get interrupted or if you don't have the time, you can leave after half an hour and that's totally cool. We'll be here for you when you're ready to come back. So that's sort of the a little bit of the yeah. model in the story, I think. If Destiny would do that and allow me to buy previous seasons and work through them at my own pace, I would 100% give them way more of my money. But the fact that they're constantly gone forever and then I can never get them again and then while the season is active, I have to continually log in daily. That just feels so bad, man. Yeah. Yeah. But and anyway, I think... I think yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Anyway, I was just going to say, I think it's important for us to be at peace with what games mean to us because just having yeah. so many people in the chat say, yeah, I feel guilty all the time or I have that experience, I, I feel that way. That I think that is going to corrupt our ability to be good game developers good game creators if we have that sense of of guilt or, or dread or like or whatever so just be mindful of that if you can come to peace with that then i think you can if you say well what i do is i play games for an hour that's it and i play these types of games because they allow me to play for an hour i don't get sucked in and i'm playing till four right. in the morning then you can design those sorts of games yourself and you kind of you can feel in integrity with yourself um yeah yeah. Anywho, good conversation. Yeah, we uh, we changed subjects a little bit, but it was fun. As we do. Yeah. We do. Any final questions before we uh, leave all you wonderful, beautiful people? Let's see if there's any we've missed. Uh, there was a question about Godot. Yes, we absolutely will do a Godot course. A little bit waiting for Godot 4 or Godot, however you want to say it. Godot makes a lot more sense, but I just learned to say Godot, Godot. so that's why I keep saying it that way. Um, Godot. Godot. When Godot. God God Ot. Goat. Uh, when version four is out, that seems to be the best time to to do something. But uh, if you're interested, if you always wanted to be an instructor and work with Game Dev TV and make a Godot Go Dot God Dot course, then uh, God Dot. Um, God Dot. That's my favorite. God Dot. I'm gonna use that from now on. God Dot it. God. <laughs> God it. I'll God it. God it. Got it. Yeah. Um, the other, just just touching on our conversation about games and guilt, um, someone was saying it's pretty much the same with TV. I, I agree. I think it's it's leisure and it's entertainment. It's a really critical part of us being, you know, having meaning in our life and and doing what we want. You just can't all always be work, 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 grind, grind, grind. You need to have downtime. You need to have leisure and entertainment. And I think games, TV, reading a book, uh, you know chatting online these things are all in that similar bucket and they're very important it's just moderation moderation for these things agree um cool 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 well i think that's all the main questions um uh marcus from oz great conversation time to get back to code monkeys course thank you guys absolutely jump back into the unity turn-based strategy course that we created with uh with hugo who is code monkey very recently uh, tim Thanks for looking after things while I couldn't figure out how to turn a computer on. I appreciate that. Thanks for showing up. Thanks for showing up. <laughs> no worries. I like the way you say, thanks for showing up, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for not having your computer explode. No, it was fun. It always is. And we will see all of you lovely people next week. Thanks for joining us today, you guys. Catch you later. Bye, everybody.